Good evening or good morning or good afternoon or whatever you're going to be listening to this recording. Uh, welcome to another session of Aussie Live 2015. And tonight we'll have uh, Georgina Patsy from Edge Amazing and <coughs> she's um, uh, I'm not going to actually go through the every uh, single thing she, she's done, otherwise I'm going to be here, here forever. But before we do, I'd like to um, thank all the support sponsors <laughs> and um, Steve Hargadon as well. And just before I hand it over to Georgina, if you can uh, put your cursor or put the symbols to where we are all coming from. So I'm just going to put that one right here at Victoria in Melbourne. Oh, I actually need to turn on the whiteboard. And which one would they? Choose. Oops, sorry. Now, which one do I need to turn on? Uh, I think it's the little rectangular one, Shingo, that is about the fourth one along. Rectangular one, fourth one along. Um, I can't actually find it, sorry. I'm um, just sure where the, participant, the participant's window is. I, I think I've just turned it on. There it is. That's it. Yeah, I've turned, I think I've turned it on. Yeah. Okay, so where's everyone from? And we'll drag one across. I think most of us are in Australia somewhere. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just hand it over to Georgina and uh, she can t tell us um, all Thank about you. it and um, everything else. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much, Shingo. Uh, welcome everyone. It's wonderful, wonderful to have you here on board. Uh, my name is Georgina Pazzi and yes, I do work for a place called Edge Amazing and I, I feel very privileged to be working at such a place because I get to work with lots of students, I get to work with lots of schools and I get to travel and to see some amazing things that happen in education and to be part of it as well. And I'm really pleased today to be sharing with you the Digitally Extraordinary and what is going to be mainly focused on are two schools that I actually have the privilege to, to uh, be part of in terms of visiting the schools and getting to know them because I often find that in education we talk about a lot of things that are going on but to actually be there to see what's happening is another story because that's where you actually understand how things happen. So I'm hoping through this story and this journey I'm able to share with you what truly is digitally extraordinary. Uh, before we begin, what I'd like to know from you all so far, and you can just put this on the chat, is uh, I know you've been involved with some wonderful sessions so far. I'd love to know what has inspired you so far in the sessions that you've actually been part of. Now if you like you can put it um, on the screen as a, um, a, like a whiteboard or you may just add it to the chat so we can see what you've actually learned from your experiences so far. All so much, that's great to hear me, such as what's actually resonated with you so far that you'd love to try or perhaps uh, it's ignited a passion for you. Okay, so giftedness, yeah, fantastic. Anyone else like to add to that? That's fabulous. Ordinary educators doing some amazing things, which actually probably makes them extraordinary. And we've got lightning at the back here. Here's how the power doesn't go off on us. Fingers crossed. 
collaborative platforms, collaboration, fantastic. Gifted, uh, yeah, so gifted seems to be coming up, which is fabulous because we often don't um, talk about those kids as much, do we, in education? We're always focusing on the other end, so giftedness is hugely important, absolutely. And flat connections, yes, the wonderful work of, of Julie Lindsay, absolutely. And cultures, and we are comfortable with that, yes. Okay, so it looks as though we're all from Australia. Uh, I, I hope um, some of our overseas people get to see this too. I'm just reading through everything, fantastic. <laughs> you have two and <laughs> Okay, well I'm going to keep moving on because this is what this is about, an inspiration and we have a wonderful uh, tool here to be able to inspire one another. Now I'm hoping today after this particular uh, presentation you'll also be inspired to probably reflect on what you're doing and acknowledge the great things that you are doing in education because I must say travelling around the world and seeing lots of things in action, I really do believe here in Australia we have a lot to, to celebrate because we have so many amazing educators and just seeing the list here already uh, joining us today, I'm hoping this will be very reaffirming for you in what it is that we're actually going to, to be sharing. Now I have another question, you'll see this every now and then because it's not just about me talking, it's also about you being part of the conversation as well. If you think about digitally extraordinary, and I might call it DE for short, why, why do you think we need to be digitally extraordinary? Why do you think we need to be? Would you please just respond to that just quickly? Why do we have to be that way? <coughs> Absolutely, we are missing out on opportunities, aren't we? Because it actually blocks us from progressing. If we're not thinking about progress and being extraordinary, we're going to keep being ordinary, aren't we? <laughs> 15 minutes of fave, okay. Beyond our comfort zone, absolutely. And even uh, for me, I've been in the digital world, let's say, as a leader, as a teacher for oh, many years now and even as a student, uh, I was probably 16 years old when we had uh, a computer in a, in a lab many, many years ago and it's interesting that in all this time we still have people in their comfort zone not willing to get out and explore the extraordinary and what we can actually be as leaders and, and inspire others to, to make a greater difference as well. Yes, the digital footprint, absolutely, fantastic. Well, let's see what else we can discover as we move on to. I want to talk about data-driven education because to me this has been a huge blocker for us but we can do something about it as well. With data-driven education, standardisation is pretty much at the forefront of many schools. I'm actually finishing research at the moment on my thesis on the externalisation of education and the forgotten child and how standardisation has really brought us unstuck, I suppose, or actually I should say it the other way around, it's really um, changing the paradigm of what education should be and it's people that are doing the digitally extraordinary in education that are actually moving us forward and they're the ones, they're the pioneers, they're the ones we should be looking at to see, well, even if this is happening around us, what else can we do to make a difference? So something data driven education can can be a plus in some ways if the data is used responsibly and for change in terms of the learner. But un unfortunately there's al al already learning limit limitations where we're, we're in boxes and we need to actually get out. And digital technologies I'm seeing even in classrooms and with students and even the question I get what app can I have for literacy or numeracy, what's the best one out there and we're really looking at things as, as consumption rather than creation because of the data driven world that we're in. We need to now shift that and rethink what education should be now and look at those that are digitally extraordinary to help us get there. <coughs> the most powerful elements actually 
can't always be measured. And these are the things that we talk about a lot when we go into digital DE schools. Passion, creativity, motivation and engagement. We all know the beauty that the digital world brings to be able to harness these elements and yet we must be careful that we don't lose sight of them when we're in a standardised, measurable society. Innovation's the other one. Uh, DE schools, whenever you walk into one, you'll know straight away because innovation is happening everywhere. And I'm pretty sure, looking at the uh, wonderful lot of uh, people that are here today, that innovation would be occurring in your school in all sorts of different ways. A DE school is always innovative. They're always looking out to do something more than what is already there. They're, they're going beyond that comfort zone that you described and reaching out and ensuring that they're always challenging themselves to keep improving. The three R's, these are, these are interesting in themselves when we look at DE schools or schools in general. We used to have the old three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and some of us unfortunately are still in that era. But I actually look at these three R's that to me have been pertinent in the work that I've done for, in, in all honesty, the last 20 or so years. To me, it's got to be real. If you're actually working with students, whether it's virtual or it's face-to-face -face and it's, in, it's an in, around their environment, the re real, realism of what they're actually looking at learning is crucial to their learning. It also needs to be relevant to them, so it has to connect to their real, real world and what is happening around them at that present time. Now, the richness is quite interesting as well. This is something that I find is unfortunately because of time not taken into account because we're trying to tick boxes and meet curriculum needs. But the DE school finds time and allows richness and diversity to be happening in their classroom. I should actually call them learning spaces because that's where the true understanding of what's happening uh, ha occurs in the classroom or learning space. These are the three R's I believe that will take us forward and continue to take us forward and I really don't believe that they'll be changing because these are, to me, where we need to be when it comes to being DE schools. Now, where does Digitally Extraordinary or DE begin? Now, this is a question for all of you once again. Where do you think, if I wanted to be in a DE school, where do you think I need to begin? I've got some of you thinking here. Can you all hear me? Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, that's good. So if we wanted to be a DE school or even a classroom or a learning space, where would we begin? Would Where do you like, think it all begins? Would you like voice for that? Okay, or can I rest just on the Oh, you can, you, you, can, you, can, you can actually add to the page if there you want you to, or okay. we can just use the chat. Or can I challenge some of you to actually use the whiteboard if you haven't used it before? We'll get you out of your comfort zone as well. So, you know, uh, there is a question from Ness. Yes? Yes, Ness. Uh, it's not really a question, I just thought I'd speak. Um, I did put in my my statement that um, it looks like everyone was doing it at the same time. I was just um, reflecting on, on that whole idea of being a DE. And for me, it started with me in my classroom with my little learners showing what they were capable of to other, other classrooms. So. I guess it's it's me not just by myself but with my learners and showing what can be achieved. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. 
there's anyone else like to add to that as well? You, you may speak as well. It would be great to hear from you and your own experiences because remember we're all coming here. This is what I call collective wisdom. We all come together from our own experience, our own understanding of what happens in the world and we're all right as well. This is from our own perspective so I'm more than happy to hear what else you have to say and then I can share with you what I've seen in the schools that I work in and visit as well. Okay, so we've got quite a few different answers which is, like I said, it's all about our own experience. Well, I'm going to actually share with you where I've seen it happen. For me, it starts with extraordinary leadership and I know, Ness, that you talked about your own leadership in the classroom and that's absolutely exactly what happens. Someone has to take charge, someone's got to lead and someone's got to make it happen. From a whole school perspective and even for me as a leader in the school and as, as an ex-assistant principal as well, it was so important for us as a leadership team to really look at how we can make this school extraordinary. And, it, and interestingly enough, I haven't actually put a DE leader here. I've actually just said an extraordinary leader because the leader themselves doesn't have to be digitally um, aware either in terms of their own skills and knowledge. It's more that they're actually open to change and also wanting to challenge the paradigms of what education is. And this is where I've seen the schools that I've been part of really moving forward and this is, these are the leaders that I'm going to share with you today. These are the leaders that want to go beyond and they're very resourceful and this is a huge word in uh, DE schools in terms of being resourceful and finding if I don't have the skills where can I get them and throughout the world we're able to actually tap into skills now because we can connect to people that way. So being a leader in a school doesn't mean to, doesn't actually mean that you are uh, the digital guru of the school. It just means that you have a vision for excellence in your school and you want to move your school forward using uh, digital tools as well. So, what does an extraordinary leader invest in most? So, if I'm if I'm in a, a school and I'm leading a school, what do you think I'm going to invest in most to create a DE school? What do you think it would be? Once again, you can talk, you can text or you can add to the screen as well. I know I'm really getting you to think here but it's really important to um, think about your own experiences and what, and what you bring here as well. So what do you think as a leader I would need to invest most in to create the DE school? Hi, I thought I'd use my voice this time. This is Hi, Carol. Coach Carol. And I thought... Hello Coach Carol. <laughs> Hello. Uh, for me, I think it follows on neatly from what you were saying about the leaders. I think if we have uh, a system of mentorship within the school whereby the leaders can then support the staff in what they do. I've seen that work in higher education and in community settings. I think that's what we need in the schools and developing a project for uh, acknowledging and supporting champions of digitally extraordinary schools would be the mm -hmm. way to go. You need mm -hmm. money because all <laughs> that is over and above what you're asking this classroom teacher to do. Right? If you want to release yes. them for a day for training, you've got to pay for someone to come in. Yes. So invest in a digital, a digitally extraordinary mentor program. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Coach Carol. Absolutely. Has anyone else got a different point of view here, which is great to hear as well? We've got quite a few things happening here. Um, fantastic. So we've got the staff. First, to exploit new frontiers, yes, but once again, where? Where are we going to get that? Our first, it starts with the first, but where is that going to lead? What are we actually investing in to make that happen? You're a failure, yes. Simple ideas. Okay, now I'm going to move on here, fantastic. So we've got quite a few um, similar, similar things that we've been hearing. The government school, which we're a government school outstanding grant writer, okay, so trying to get some funds in. 
Well, interestingly enough, I worked in a school that was classes a low socioeconomic school, and so we were quite disadvantaged uh, quite a few years ago with one of the schools I worked in. And what we did is we re looked at the budget and we looked at what our priorities were. And interestingly enough, you're saying a government school uh, and looking at, at being a grant writer, we actually had a proposition uh, that we went to the Department of Education here in Victoria with. And we pretty much said, can you give us money? We want to show you how one person can make a difference to a school. And we actually got funding for it. And interestingly enough, within three months, we actually turned, it, turned everything on its head when it came to digital learning. And what we actually started off was my next slide, which is human capital. And that is people. And, uh, and we were able to do it in a school that didn't have funds. Yes, we did get more funds from, from the government. And we actually proved within the research that we did that one person can make a difference in the school when it came to leadership. But the leadership that we actually invested in was human capital, our teachers. It wasn't actually our students because we knew our students were digitally savvy anyway. But it was our teachers that um, we needed to invest in. Interestingly enough, too, I'm seeing a lot of BYOD schools starting. And sometimes I think that we really need to look at the speed at which this is happening because although our students are BYOD ready, unfortunately our teachers are not. And not, some of them are, just as I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone that's joining me here in this room is. But unfortunately we need to do a lot more when it comes to the teachers' understanding. And the mentoring program you mentioned, Coach Carol, absolutely. And we need to look at uh, the research that's telling us and we're looking at proximal versus distal. Proximal means that the teacher's the one that makes the difference in the classroom far more than the school itself. So by investing in our teachers, they actually can make a huge difference because they're the ones that enable the learning to happen and they're the ones that have to actually understand the importance of it. I'm going to actually share with you how it actually can work to, make, to really create the DE school as we move on as well. But the digital power and the leverage these teachers need is, is, is by giving them the opportunity to actually see what, it, what, what we talk about when we say DE schools, what do they actually look like? And often when I've actually spoken with teachers and worked with them, what's ha what happens is teachers get bits and pieces of what digital excellence is and, and the digital is really extraordinary. What they end up seeing is parts. They don't actually see the whole. And a lot of the time I say to schools, get your teachers out of your school and visit these schools, talk to these teachers, connect online and actually see the whole picture of what the pedagogy is because that's when they actually get it. Seeing bits and pieces just isn't enough. And the professional development that they need to be able to understand what it actually really means to be effective in the way we use uh, our technology that is what we need to invest in with our teachers. Now, I'll just share this with you. This was something I presented to Julia Gillard when she was the Education Minister in 2008. It was an 11th hour meeting with her when we were looking at the digital revolution because I pretty much said to her, for us to make this work, we need all factors to be considered in order to have digital success. And and she, she was quite keen on hearing what they were because just giving people technology does not change uh, a school. It doesn't change pedagogy. What you've got to do is have that pedagogy to start with and also other things that have to be in line with it as well. And, and so we actually explored all those, these actual factors and they're still relevant today. Leadership, vision and planning, pedagogy, professional learning, curriculum resources, infrastructure, environment, community connectivity, all of them together create sustainable change in schools. And this is what we really need to be looking at to create a blueprint that's going to actually move us forward. One school I worked with, uh, we actually looked at the, uh, the staff and looked at their, their actual uh, skills and understandings and we actually stepped back and said, we're not ready for BYOD. We need to work with our staff first to understand it, to understand what it is and what it looks like before we move on. So I think sometimes we're in too much of a hurry in some schools and I think we need to step back and really focus on quality rather than a quantity approach that actually can make a huge difference to, where we, for, for, to our students and our teachers as well. One school I'd like to mention, and some of you may know this school. Does anyone know this school? Dallas Brooks Community Primary School. 
Got any raise of hands there? Does anyone know? Okay. Now, this is a school when I was doing some uh, consultancy work in the metro region for the department in 2006 on interactive whiteboards. This is a school that I visited. It was actually known as Dallas Primary School then. And I was absolutely amazed at this school because they were given uh, interactive whiteboards. And for them, it was a huge shift in terms of, OK, we've got these boards. What do we do? And they already had a pedagogy in place, which was interesting in itself. And so they even applied for funds and ended up getting some funds through a philanthropic organisation. So every classroom had an interactive whiteboard. But what I noticed that was really different between this school and many of the others that I visited was their focus was on their teachers, the professional development. Every single week they would get together. They even had a room with an interactive whiteboard in it. And their focus was on the pedagogy itself, not just the tool and what it did. So they really, really looked at and unpacked what it was. They researched what, what, um, what, makes, what makes it work in a classroom. And they achieved quite a lot of success. Interestingly enough, the leadership, the three women, Valerie, Lynn and Amanda, Valerie's the uh, principal and, the, and who's still there too, they were just amazing in their vision to try and change the way their teachers worked with their students. And so professional learning was underpinning everything they did and through that, pedagogy and curriculum flowed. And so there were huge shifts because we're looking at a school here in the northern suburbs of of Melbourne, uh, high EAL uh, population as well, and yet these leaders managed to turn that school around to the point where they also became a Microsoft Pathfinder school in 2009. Because of the, the way they worked with their students, it was quite amazing that they were recognised for their work. And it only started out because of that leadership capacity that they had for, for, the D, for being a DE. And interestingly enough, now they became an innovative school in 2010 and now they're actually a showcase school. So if you're ever in Melbourne, you ever want to visit an amazing school, this is one that I would thoroughly recommend uh, to you as well. And student voice is very important in this school. And oral literacy, while I was actually astounded, their huge focus on oral literacy being such an a a a a EAL rich school was, was fascinating in itself. So there was a lot of uh, recording of students speaking and talking about learning and even uh, in, in the bottom uh, left hand side of the screen there was real projects going on. This was a, this was a debate that these students were having uh, with uh, schools in, uh, a school in uh, Brisbane about uh, deforestation which I was really, really pleased to see the connection that they were having globally. Now there's something else I want to talk to you about as well, which is quite interesting. And this is feel, think, do. You may have seen this before, but to me this is imperative when it comes to change. To be a DE school or to be a school that really wants to move forward or even within your own classroom, if you really want to engage your kids and really move things forward, you need to think second. You need to feel first. Actually understanding something through feeling creates an incentive and an excitement in you that then you, you begin to think about something and then you actually put it into action and do it. And this is also how passion is created as, as well. So if we're in environments where even for professional learning, we are able to connect our staff through feeling something in a positive way, and this is the digital world, we're already on our way to succeeding. Because some of them, unfortunately, their feeling towards a digital world isn't a positive one. So their thoughts will be quite negative. Therefore, their actions won't be as progressive as what we would want. So really think about how you can shift to feeling first, creating that excitement and that passion in your learning, then moving that to how you can think and then taking action. And this is what was happening in this school as well, where they were using digital technologies to really excite kids about how they felt about the world and, and to really empower them to actually make a difference. And this is where they became the culture of world change makers. And this is another outstanding thing I really like to talk about. Because these schools that I visit and these schools I work with want to make a difference. So they're using digital technology so, such as 
the Deforest Action pro uh, Project. You may have heard of that. I was excited when I was at ISTE and we had Do Dr. Uh, Willie Smith from Brisbane presenting and this is one of the schools in the world. There's, I think there's about eight schools in the world that are Echo Warriors and they, uh, they're there to stop global deforestation. And this is one school that is part of that. So these kids are feeling, thinking and doing in order to make a difference in the world using technology. So they're getting on uh, using technology to actually see where we're, um, where we're losing uh, tree, you know, uh, rainforests in the world and, and they're taking action to try and stop that. And the other thing I noticed too is they've become social entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. This is another big one in education too. This is something that, that the, I know the department really pushed with us here in, in Victoria a few years ago, wasn't really taking off but now that we've got the, the digital means we can connect with people all over the world and create change and in this case too they, they've actually created a logo uh, and a mascot called Carlo and Carlo uh, they created a, a lovely um, uh, like a, a, a little sticker and they're actually selling this online, selling different uh, memorabilia and, and different things to actually raise money to be able to uh, buy back land in the world to save our orangutans which I think is truly amazing and this is what it's about and this is what makes a school a DE school and I'd love to hear some of your stories as well. Is anyone else doing something similar? in their school at the moment where they're actually making a difference beyond their school. You can talk if you like. I'm just reading through all the scripting. <laughs> Are you still all with me here? Okay, yeah, so no one's got another story you. to tell? <laughs> oh, that's good. Shy. <laughs> so is there any other... Oh, are you? So Coach Carol, do you know of anyone that's doing some great things globally um, in terms of uh, world change? Uh, I'd have to say that my favourite organisation, Toastmasters, is doing that. Uh, there are uh, 353,000 members across the world and doing extraordinary things in helping people become better public speakers. Fabulous. And what about in the classroom? Uh, do you actually get them to, sp to work with students in the classroom as well? The Toastmasters are often in schools talking to groups and helping them with their presentation styles and we even have clubs for younger school students called the gavel clubs um, because you need to be 18 to get into a Toastmaster club so we have gavel clubs for school students and we have youth leadership groups at which Toastmasters are often appearing. We teach That's leadership fabulous. as well as spe speaking. Sounds like our working rotary as well. Absolutely fantastic. Well these are the sorts of things that I would encourage schools to really be looking at in terms of creating change, not within just your local community, but looking at it in, in a global perspective as well. Now, if we're thinking of passion, apart from students, what should edu educators be most passionate about in a digitally extraordinary school? So here's another, another one, another question to throw at you. Uh, what do you think? What do you think we need to be most passionate about or should we be if we want to create change in our schools? I might hear some voices here I think. I'd love to hear some of your voices. Anyone like to, to say something here in regards to what you think? Learning, okay. Nice big text there. I think someone's trying to, trying to make sure we get that message. Anyone else? Oh, you're a quiet group. 
making a difference. <laughs> yeah, I'm really amazed at how quiet they are for you tonight. They're just like I know. really nice students. Come on, guys. <laughs> Shake it oh. up. Come on, let's, let's make really a difference fun. here. I'll say really fast tonight. I want to talk more, but I keep on having my kids come at me. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Well, look, I'm going to keep moving on because there's still quite a lot for me to share. But it's actually, for me, it's actually pedagogy. It's not actually the digital tool itself. Um, when I've actually grown leaders in schools, I've actually looked yeah, for I'll leaders that understand. Yes. Hello, Anthony. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I, I just um, made it. I just... I'm glad you did, Anthony. Thank you. Okay. So when um when I talk about pedagogy instead of just the digital tool, the reason I say this is that yes, we have got, and I know people here are passionate about the digital world, and so am I. But when I've actually worked with educators, the biggest difference I've seen in the shift in a school to be a DE school is knowing and understanding that the pedagogy itself. Because if we don't understand how to use the tools, then we're not actually going to be moving forward. So we can have as many tools as we like in the school, but if we're passionate about pedagogy, we're going to find a way to make it work. That's exactly what uh, the, the Dallas School did. They actually already had the pedagogy in place and actually worked with that to make a difference. Interestingly enough, when we actually look at pedagogy, it's also changed too. It used to be the art of teaching. Now it's actually changed because we're not teaching in the DE school. We're activating learning. So it's the art of activating learning now that's shifted. So it's not the art of teaching anymore. So we need to rethink the way pedagogy looks in a DE school. Now, here's another word for you, connectivism. I've pro probably got you falling asleep by now. Um, has anyone ever heard of connectivism before? Put your hand up if you've actually um, heard of it before. Yep, Jingo. Yes, we've got a few here. Fantastic. And some of you haven't. Okay. Now it's interesting, we always talk about uh, constructivism. Well, interestingly enough, constructivism comes from constructing knowledge, but because of the way we're connected now, we're connected to a chaotic world. We have knowledge coming to us from all sorts of realms. We are connecting to people from all over the world with their knowledge, their understanding, and so now, our actual creation of knowledge is through connectivism and this is what's actually shifted in where we're going with, uh, and, and in DE schools and in life. We are now trying to sift through a world of information and connectivism is what it's actually about. It's shifted the way that we're actually learning because we're learning from others just like we're doing here and in the end we've got to piece together what we believe is accurate or not and the other thing about it is that it's ever changing. So knowledge changes as we go through connectivism as well. So DE schools find that this is a really, really important part of how things work for them. We always talk about being a connected educator. Now obviously we're connected educators here, but there's another concept that I'd like you to think about as well, and I talk about this a lot, and I use this a lot in the work that I do, and that is the three dimensions of holistic learning. Now, learning isn't just about the outside world. We know about the online world now and the cloud-based learning that we have, and we know about the offline, and that, that is what's around us in our, in our immediate environment. But there's also the inline, what's happening within us. We now have to see the world in three dimensions, in terms of our learning and in terms of connectivism. We talked about you know, character building and understanding who we are in this world. Because we are subjected to so much knowledge, we need to understand how we're part of it, how it affects us, and how we participate in the world. This is crucial in a DE school as well, because students need to know their capacities and what they can do to make a difference in the world too. So this is something I would, I would 
encourage you all to engage in because the three dimensions together are far more important than and actually a part. And even the cyber safety when we talk about that in schools, a DE school will ensure that students actually understand their own part in cyber safety, not just the externalisation of it. And that really, really is a great way to, uh, to actually understand it. And also how online and offline work together. So, okay, so I'm not uh, being positive to a person online, well, well, and, and I'm positive to them face to face. Well, it shouldn't shouldn't be any different. So they need to see the connections between it. And DE schools do that incredibly well. Now, personal learning communities. Yes, I know you've heard about this, but to me, this is vital in what it is that we do. And that is to create communities that start within our learning spaces and then stretch out to across the school to our local community to cloud-based communities, but our ultimate aim is to improve student learning through these personalised learning, personal learning communities. I'll give you a bit of an example. Let's say that you, you uh, noticed that your students wanted to, use, uh, wanted to learn about place value. They needed to learn about place value. We have that in the curriculum. It's something that we cover. How do you think you can use a personal learning community to actually make that happen? How do you think that would look? Would you like someone like to talk to us about what they think and how they think it would look? It's a quiet group tonight. <laughs> Have I overwhelmed you with information? Well, okay, I'll share with you how it could look then. Rather than your typical session where the, the teacher um, you know, shows kids or demonstrates or even works with another student to demonstrate what place value is, you can shift, shift the focus and ask them a question such as, why is it important to understand place value? And within their personal learning communities, they actually investigate and explore what place value is and actually present it through digital or through, through hands-on means how it actually works. And I've actually seen this in operation. It's quite fascinating how it brings up, especially those students at the bottom range, it brings them up a lot higher. And these are the things that we need to tap into when it comes to teaching and learning in a DE school. That is that we are no longer just showing kids. They can actually use connectivism to find out what things are and present it in a real rich and relevant way. And our personal learning communities is how we do it. The other thing about the personal learning community is that it is based on a culture of knowledge creation. And through a question, kids themselves, our students can actually, in a DE school, create their own knowledge. So through that experience, that can actually open something up far more than what it was that they were doing before. Now, infrastructure, yes, it has to get a mention because unfortunately we can be fantastic in schools in what we do, but if we don't have the infrastructure to get us online, we're in trouble. So a huge investment has to be made in schools and I've actually seen schools invest more money into getting their own infrastructure in place so that they can be connected all the time because sometimes what they've been given is limited in what they need it to do. So infrastructure in these DE schools is another huge investment that they do make. What does learning look like, feel like and sound like in a DE learning environment? Well, this is an interesting one in itself. This is a school that you may have all heard of this school. It's one of my favourites, another one. Dallas is the other one, of course, Dallas Books Community Primary School. This is a school that once again, when I was doing the uh, rounds in 2006 that I came across that I remember emailing someone in the department saying, well, Rana, wow. From the outside, this school just looks like a pretty ordinary school, but when you go in, it's the inside that counts, as they say, and boy, did it count when I walked into this school. This school is absolutely amazing in the way that it interacts with its students, and what they have is they call it a raison d'etre, which is a reason for being. Every person in that school knows what they're about. And they're about autonomous learning. And they've actually looked at Reggio Emilia and other theorists to actually create an environment for these students that's incredibly powerful and it's a DE school. They have what they call stimulating learning platforms. And within this school, 
they have purpose-built spaces, not flexible spaces. I know often we talk about having flexible spaces in schools uh, that are progressive, but in actual fact, they've discovered that having purpose-built spaces that are stimulating learning platforms actually allows them to tailor make their environment to what their students need. So depending on the need that the child has, whether it's using the, a digital tool or not, they actually go to the place that they, they actually want to, want to be part of to enhance their learning. So this is, for me, a quite, quite a huge shift because we talk about flexible spaces, we talk about um, how we want our kids to change the environment. And even in the schools I go to, I'll be totally honest with you, they don't spend a lot of time being flexible. Things usually stay pretty much the way we see them. So we've got to rethink, do we need them to be flexible or do we invest in them being purpose built or a little bit of both? And you'll notice here the dragon boat that, that um, in, the, in the photo here that, that they've got. At the very top they've got that leap motion so students just go around to different parts of uh, the, the space and it's all about their own autonomous learning and it happens from foundational prep all the way to year six and every space is conducive to the students and what what they need. So to them, flexibility is in learner autonomy and what that means is their students are using technology, using other means to actually learn, but it's all about them being flexible in what they need to learn. You may have heard of the, Ker the have you heard of the Kerbal Space Program? Anyway, can you just raise your hand if, or, or tick if you have heard of it before? Anyone heard of that before? Yes, some of you have. Well, I suggest you have a look at what this is. This is absolutely amazing. Um, it's, it's a space that you can go to. You can actually download it and it doesn't cost a lot of money. You can actually trial it as well. Uh, these students are actually saying it's better than, um, better than Minecraft. And what they actually do is they create rockets that they take, virtual rockets that actually they take out into space in, in a virtual world. And it was interesting when I was speaking to one of the students that's actually doing this in the school and the language that he was using, the, the sophistication in the rocket design that they, these kids were launching. And it was just amazing that the mathematical and the scientific understandings that these kids were ga gaining through this particular program. And this is what is this outstanding about the school. And, and actually the, the bottom uh, photo there is actually a 3D print of the uh, rocket that they actually uh, created. It's pretty a pretty small one because they said they don't have the best of 3D printers. But that's absolutely amazing. And the language the child was using to explain to me how it all worked was quite sophisticated in itself. So that even those of you that are, are looking at gifted uh, students and what they can do, it is honestly a really rich, real and relevant way for kids to be actually sparking their learning as, as a, a DE option. Now we always talk about the, the uh, 21st century skills and we know the top four quite well, critical thinking, communication, collaboration and creativity. But there's also character education and citizenship which Michael Fullen has added which I totally agree with. Uh, but there's also one more. Who'd like to guess what the seventh C should be? And some, sometimes people may not consider this a skill, it might be a, a, a someone Having, having it in their character, but if you really look at this, it's what makes learning work in a DE school. What do you think it might be? Cheeriness, yes, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Common sense, yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> Connectivism, <laughs> thank you Coach Carol. Well actually, it's curiosity. For me, when I walk into any learning space, I want to know that these students are curious about their learning. They're given opportunities to be able to foster that and to grow that. Unfortunately, in our standardised world, curiosity sometimes is hampered and what we want to do, especially in the DE schools such as Warana Park, we actually have opportunities to really allow our students to shine because they are able to harness that and we need to ensure that whenever we're even planning or we're working with students to plan opportunities to learn, we need to look at curiosity 
as being within that as well. And if you go to Warana Park, you will see that in every corner you look and it's absolutely amazing what these students have permission to be able to do in their learning as a DE school. Now you saw this uh, particular photo at the beginning of the presentation, sensing the world virtual and real. This is where it gets really exciting for me because we can't always be in the place, in the environment to really feel what it's like and to know what it's like. So what um, they've done here is they've created a, a space called the Enigma Portal. And in, as you can see here, these students are sitting there with their three iPads and they've got uh, the three screens in front of them. And what they're doing here is they're actually virtually learning. And uh, the Enigma Portal uh, is, is, uh, is part of what um, started off as the David Thornburg um, philosophy of thinking of a theatre without audience where students are actually put into an environment where they don't have the audience but they have to act, act out uh, different, different uh, scenarios and missions to be able to solve a problem together. There's also the Knights of Knowledge. I'm not sure if you've heard Knights of Knowledge before, which I recommend you have a look at as well. And they're inquiry starters into, into the, they're not real worlds, but they're exciting worlds for students to be able to inquire and solve problems. So having these particular um, scenarios in your own learning space where kids are sensing the world and understanding the world, that's where change can really happen. So I'm really excited when I see this as well. The other thing that happens too in a DE school and in a DE environment is the flow. Now you might, may have seen Mihai Cheats and Mihai's um, flow, flow chart that I've got here. It's not the typical flow chart. But this is amazing. When I actually go into an environment where curiosity is fostered, students are using different tools, including digital technologies, the DE school, I know that these kids are in the flow. This is where learning happens. And it's what they call an autotelic experience where the goal itself for these students is fulfilling. That's where the motivation is. That's where the excitement is for these kids and they're learning all the time. So I would really, really encourage you to have a look at um, what this is about in your, in your classroom or in your learning space. And you'll notice too, um, it, you've got boredom and you've got anxiety. So if students are actually bored, what you've got to do is increase the challenge because you'll notice challenges on, is on one side and skills is at the bottom. So if they're bored, you increase the challenge. If they're anxious, you develop their skills and they, you get them back into the flow. And this is where I would encourage you to be thinking as a DE school how can our students be working in the flow? And I'm going to be talking about something that actually stifles that, and that's on the next slide here, and that is time. Now, if you're in a DE school, you're not going to be having lessons. You're going to be having learning experiences. And this is huge because you want students to be deep learners. You want them to actually finish what they start and understand it significantly. So rather than trying to to fit in all this curriculum, what you want kids to do is to be able to use the technology, use the other tools, and instead of being time dependent lessons, they're time negotiated learning experiences. So whatever task they are going to do, whatever they're exploring, they're able to actually fulfill and finish what it is that they've started. Even for me as a learning coach, I work with students with all sorts of different abilities and one thing I know they struggle with is the opportunity to actually show they can do something because they're not given the time to actually show that they can do it. So I really would encourage you to really look at something like this within your learning. You would actually be surprised at the end of it when you look at curriculum how many boxes you actually tick through that learning experience that they have because you'd be surprised what we've seen in terms of what they actually cover. It is an exciting, really exciting thing to be doing and rethinking time blocks in our learning experiences in classrooms or in learning spaces. I'm nearly there. The power of learning modalities. Okay, this is something that really excites me because for me, I work with learning modalities and that is, is it print? Is it digital? Or is it tactile? And so we, we think about, and or is it oral? Is it, um, is it uh, auditory? 
when we're dealing with a DE school, we're looking at learning modalities and that is we are harnessing the sensory experience for a child. We are just not working in a one-dimensional way. We are working in a multi-dimensional way where we can harness the power of the digital world to excite and engage learners. Now, one thing I want you to consider, and this is, this is something that um, the digital world we can do so well, is what we call accelerators. And accelerators to me are the sparks of learning that we use in our learning spaces to ignite curiosity and passion for learning. And even for our own staff that we work with, what can we show them that's digital or not? That's actually going, that uses modalities that's going to spark that learning. Now remember the feel, think and do. So through video, for example, we can actually harness a feeling towards something or of something that actually gets them to understand that. If we're looking at professional development, how can we use learning modalities to be able to excite teachers, or I should say activators of learning, about the, the wonderful things they can be doing for their students in the classroom? These are the things that we need to be looking at. And assessment. In assessment, what can we do, what learning modalities can we use to assess students? I often ask teachers to, to have a look at their work pro program and have a look at how many different modalities they use for assessment. Some don't even put assessment in their work program and those that do often find it's print based. A DE school will use all learning modalities to ensure that students are able to assess, self-assess or be part of an assessment process that maximises the learning and the learner. Now, I'm nearly done and I've got two minutes to go. I've done quite well, I think. Um, beyond skill development, we are in a knowledge creation society or we are supposed to be. And when you go back to your learning space, ask your teachers, do we create knowledge or do we only develop skills? because knowledge creation is what it's about. This is what we need our students to be harnessing and doing. Are they able to say at the end of that learning experience that they've actually been able to create knowledge? Now this photo here is an interesting one in itself. It's a Coda dojo that they have at Orana Park and on a Sunday they invite 8 to 16 year olds and they have a mentor where uh, they're actually hacking the digital world and they're actually increasing their numbers to the point where they have to knock people back because they're finding students are really engaged in making, uh, creating knowledge and changing the state of play using coding. Now the photo of the adult that's there is quite fascinating in itself because he's actually the technician of the school and I find it exciting to see a technician involved in the curriculum as well and in the understanding the pedagogy and when you have a technician in your school that can do that, you are definitely going to go places because once they understand it, you'd be surprised how many gates open in terms of the possibilities in the school and, and Kieran is just absolutely remarkable at, at, at supporting these students to do exciting projects and, and have exciting learning experiences as well. Now just to let you know, I, I don't just stop at Edumazing because for us we're also going to be creating a, the Star Learning Foundation here in Melbourne. This is actually a plan, an architect plan of the building where we're at at the moment that's going to be gutted one day to al allow us to work and create a DE environment for kids at highest risk in our community. So for us, the sorts of things that I've spoken you to you about, we want to actually work with young people that have perhaps lost their way uh, in, in the world and we want to be able to show them just how important they are and to use the DE process to really excite them about life and learning and change the paradigm of whether, where it is if they're heading in their lives. So for me as an educator, I find this ex incredibly exciting because I don't just talk about stuff, I really do believe you need to walk your talk and, and I look forward to one day uh, telling you more about this exciting project that uh, we're going to be undergoing for, for children that are in need and we're looking at doing this right across Australia but we're starting here in Wyndham to begin with. So more, more on that later on but um, yeah, it's a quite an interesting, exciting space. Now, timer, I'm out. So um, what does digitally extraordinary mean to you now? Am I still on? No, I'm still on until Shingo turns you off. <laughs>
Okay, good. I am finished. I've just said the last one. Now, if I was to ask you now, I'm hoping that some things have sparked in your own mind about what you can do when you go back to your space and excite others with, with learning. What does it mean to you now that we've actually um, talked about it? Can anyone just, just give us some feedback, please? <coughs> Yeah, my feedback for you is definitely that you're on the right track here in the schools for your DE school program because it reminds me so much of what we did in TAFE and in community. And I think for me, what you do in describing it and exploring it with us is actually inspire us to do more, to break out of our comfort zone and to help to do the things that you are asking us to do. <laughs> Is that what you're thinking, Joe? Okay. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> Absolutely fabulous. Yes. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, it's it's quite it's quite interesting. I'm, and I know for me too, I just just to get you thinking this way, a DE school is actually an educationally extraordinary school. And I think you probably picked that up throughout what I was saying. And notice I didn't talk about what type of iPods, you know, what iPods we're using in the school, what type of devices, because that's really irrelevant because they change. But to be a DE school, you're already edu educationally extraordinary. And we need to remember that too. And what I will say is we are the digitally extraordinary. And I'm pretty sure that I preached to the converted here today. And I, I'm going to get really excited, I know, by hearing all of your stories and the great things that you actually do in your schools. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you some great things that I've seen in education. I could spend all day talking about this because I'm very, very passionate about education and the exciting things that are going on. So thank you so, so much uh, for sharing this with me. And thank you to the schools for allowing me to share their stories too because it was with permission as well. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you very much, um, Georgie. You know, it was uh, I think an hour just going very, very quickly, and uh, I think most, all, like all of us, agree that um, we can just sit here and uh, discuss um, all these um, digitally extraordinary, like all nights, and um, still we'll have come up with um, new things <laughs> and uh, innovative things to say. And uh, I think this is the recording that I probably should be sending to pretty much all the principal. And around Australia, and to get them to start thinking about uh, these um, innovation and new ideas, and how they can, I guess, um, influence the, the teachers and the students. So, um, can we get a um, round, round of applause for um, Georgina for her time and her effort? And um, we usually get the, the people to um, the same this slide, but I'm not quite sure if. Well, what's what's actual permission will be. So I'm just going to leave it up to you. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank and you so much again, everyone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina.